Fire Emblem Three Houses. It's one of the most popular games in the franchise, but I've never had that much love for it. The monastery sections always slowed down the pace of the game for me, and while I could see that the narrative and characters were well put together, it never really clicked for me like it did for others. But then, I came up with a way to put this game to the test, to see if it was truly the grand political drama it sought to be, and whether it could earn my admiration once more. Put simply, I set out to ask and answer one simple question. Can you beat Fire Emblem Three Houses without committing a war crime? Now first off, let's address some ground rules. You'll likely have heard of the Geneva Conventions, a series of conventions, articles, and resolutions which outline countless offences and misconducts that would be punishable by the international community. In short, everything outlined within the Geneva Conventions will be applicable to this run, though a large majority of it won't be relevant to the setting and story of Fodlan. But in an effort to make this challenge as airtight as possible, we'll be bringing out the big guns, the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, specifically Part 2, Article 8, which outlines a number of different violations for us to adhere to. The next thing is that anything considered an accepted feature of martial combat in Fodlan will be permitted. Our international laws on war crimes may not account for magic or wyverns, but for the sake of ease, anything that doesn't stray from the accepted norms in Fodlan will be permissible. This doesn't extend to anything specifically outlawed by the Rome Statute, however including poison, asphyxiating gases, or weapons that are of a nature to cause unnecessary suffering. Beyond that, we'll be playing on hard difficulty, to keep things interesting without ensuring I'm stuck here smacking my head against a wall on maddening difficulty, since we'll be making things difficult enough ourselves. Lastly, as expected, there will be spoilers for pretty much the entirety of Three Houses, and it's worth clarifying that this challenge is mainly for fun. I'd better not see this video referenced in someone's Edelgard did nothing wrong dissertation. Except my own. So after creating our lawful, peace-loving protagonist Geneva, it's time to kick things off with the prologue. Firstly, let's address the thing that I'm sure is at the forefront of everyone's mind. Child soldiers. Well, maybe not on everyone's mind, but it's certainly a very important distinction for the sake of this challenge. At the start of the game, the students in Garrick Mark Officers Academy range from 15 years old to 22 years old. Strictly speaking, all of these characters would be legally permitted to participate in combat. Both international humanitarian law and the Rome Statute declare that a child soldier is classified as anyone under the age of 15. With that said, 18 is the most common age worldwide for anyone to be considered an adult. So with that distinction in mind, we'll be classifying anyone below the age of 18 as a child soldier, and therefore prohibited. This means that Lysithia, Petra, Linhart, Ash, Caspar, Annette, Ignatz, Felix, Ingrid, Dimitri, Bernadetta, Marianne, Claude, Edelgard, Raphael, and Ferdinand are all prohibited, though we'll touch on that again later. For the sake of the prologue, this means that only Geneva is authorized to participate in combat, so I immediately disarm Edelgard, Dimitri, and Claude, and press forward. I use the Iron Axe to fight the bandits as much as possible to start building up Geneva's axe rank, which will become a running theme throughout the challenge. By taking advantage of the forest and the extra vulneraries from the students, I take care of the remaining bandits with a little help from Gerald, finishing the chapter at level 3. Once I arrive at Garrick Monk Monastery, and after a bit of story, it's time for perhaps the most important decision in the entire challenge. Which of the three houses do I choose to lead? The Black Eagles, led by Edelgard, the Blue Lions, led by Dimitri, or the Golden Deer, led by Claude? Believe it or not, this decision isn't as complicated as it first appears. Let's start with Claude. Unfortunately for everyone's favourite strategist, Claude is a war criminal, or at least he will be. In the war phase of the Verdant Wind route, Claude enacts a plan to assault Fort Mercius, in which his army disguises themselves as Imperial soldiers, and then engages in a mock skirmish with soldiers in Alliance uniform. Section 2b, paragraph 7 of the Rome Statute prohibits making improper use of a flag of truce, of the flag, or of the military insignia and uniform of the enemy. In other words, using a disguise like this is in fact a war crime. Plus, with Claude's penchant for poison, which is also prohibited, steering clear of the deer is probably in our best interests. As for Dimitri, he's out too, for two reasons. First up is section 2b paragraph 1, intentionally directing attacks against the civilian population, or against individual civilians not taking part in hostilities. In the Azure Moon route, Byleth kills Fleisch, a civilian member of House Burglies, after she attacks Dimitri which is a war crime directly committed by the player avatar. It's debatable if Fleisch can be considered taking direct part in hostilities, but let's say for the argument that she isn't. Unfortunately, this isn't the only transgression in Azure Moon. Dimitri's iconic order to kill every last one of them is a dramatic and memorable moment during the Battle of Grondefield, 
But believe it or not, it also classifies as a war crime, introducing Section 2B Paragraph 12, declaring that no quarter will be given. No quarter means to kill any and all enemy soldiers. Allied combatants would not take prisoners, show mercy, or have any pity. And unfortunately for Dmitri, declaring the order to kill every last one of them is as clear a declaration of no quarter as you can get. So believe it or not, that leaves us with just one option. Edelgard and the Black Eagle House. Edelgard, as anyone who has played the game themselves will know, presents her own obstacles to this challenge, but we'll address those down the line. We've got the entire Academy arc to get past after all. The next noteworthy event is on the 30th of the Great Tree Moon. Not only is this the day of the next combat, the mock battle between the three houses, it also happens to be the day of Ferdinand von Eyer's 18th birthday. That's right, as the year progresses, students will celebrate their birthdays, and any student celebrating their 18th birthday will be permissible to fight in combat without classifying as a child soldier. Ferdinand is the first instance of this, but there'll be others throughout the Academy arc. Though it could be argued that a mock battle doesn't constitute a real battle, and therefore war crimes wouldn't apply, it's also time that we address a few concepts that will be quite common throughout the run. These are accountability, affiliation, and caution. In this challenge, Geneva is accountable for her own actions, the actions of those in her command, namely the pupils in her house and eventual soldiers in her army, as well as the actions of her affiliation. For Geneva, that's currently the Church of Seros. I won't be using affiliation as a hard and fast rule, however. To use Manuela as an example, though she's from Enbar, her affiliation at the start of the game is to the Church of Seros rather than the Eudrestian Empire. Affiliations will change throughout the game, but generally I'll be leaning on what the unit's affiliation is at the start of the game as an indicator of best approach. And when there's no clear indicator of whether something would constitute as a war crime or not, I'll be acting with caution. With caution in mind, I undeployed every student below the age of 18 except for Edelgard, who's forced deployed. That leaves our mock battle force as Geneva, Dorothea, Ferdinand, and an unarmed Edelgard who's prohibited from combat. It's worth noting that I could have deployed Hubert as well, but I forgot. Fortunately for me, any unit deaths in this battle are forgiven, and the chapter is eventually cleared by having Geneva knuckle down in a forest using a vulnerary every other turn, while Edelgard cowers in the corner. Once I return to the monastery, I start to lay the foundation for the future. Geneva unlocks their first certification as a Myrmidon, which once mastered will give a nice plus two speed to help out with early combat. I then seek out Sylvain. Sylvain is an incredibly important part of this challenge for a number of reasons. First, he's 18 years old at the start of the Academy arc, meaning I never have to worry about him classifying as a child soldier. Second, he's the only student from another house who can immediately be recruited, as Geneva is a female professor. There's one more extremely important reason for Sylvain's recruitment, but I'll leave that one as a surprise. With Sylvain recruited, I get to work on my lesson plan for all of the students. Ferdinand and Sylvain are set to prioritize training their axe and flying skills, while Dorothea trains in reason and faith to unlock a wider repertoire of spells. The skill focus for the other students isn't too important, but I eventually set the majority of these to be whatever their strongest skill was and that alone. The reason being that I could use any students with a greater skill proficiency than my own to raise my own skills during the war arc. I also participated in an auxiliary battle. These will feature infrequently, and only when I have a monastery quest to complete or for select Parallax. Grinding experience with additional auxiliary battles is off limits. Eventually, it's time for the next chapter, routing a group of bandits at Xanado, the Red Canyon. Sylvain and Ferdinand take up the front lines alongside Geneva, and I also deploy Hubert this time to help deal chip damage and weaken foes for my other units to defeat. Beyond that, the map is pretty straightforward, besides one thing, a treasure chest. The site of battle is described by many characters as being home to ruins and having been a site of religious significance. With that in mind, I err on the side of caution and leave the chest locked to avoid breaching section 2E paragraph 5 of the Rome Statute, which prohibits looting and pillaging a town or place. By the end of the chapter, I'm able to get Geneva to level 7, Sylvain to level 6, and Ferdinand and Dorothea to level 5. Back at the monastery, I certify Ferdinand and Sylvain for the fighter classes, while Dorothea earns the monk class. This is also the month I unlock the Battalions Guild, where we can hire new battalions to augment our unit's combat prowess and grant access to gambits. Battalions are unlocked throughout the game, either as a quest reward or accessible through the guild, but some of these will be off limits. For example, any battalions with the poison tactic gambit, such as the merchant military, are prohibited, as the use of poison is a war crime. After another month of pottering around the monastery, Archbishop Rey assigns me my next mission, to defeat a militia army led by Lord Lonato, a minor lord from the kingdom. This presents a problem. While most of the enemies are Gaspard soldiers, there are also a number of civilian militia. While the militia has dialogue showing their sympathy to Lord Lonato, 
proving that they're both willing and militant in their affiliation to the rebel army, I err on the side of caution by luring the militia members out of Catherine's way with students wielding bows, leaving them unable to harm the militia when they attack at close range. Fortunately, Lord Lenato goes down without too much problem, and I make it past the first major obstacle of the run. Chapter 4 is up next, and with this we have our first non-combatants, three priests who wield nothing but restorative magic, and are therefore protected by section 2e paragraph 2 as medical personnel. It's worth noting that in Three Houses, offensive white magic does exist, and any soldiers who wield both offensive and restorative magic could not be considered non-combatants. The other consideration here are the two chests, as this battle occurs in the Holy Mausoleum, a place of religious significance owned by the church, I leave these chests unopened, giving up on an intermediate seal and some spirit dust. There is one silver lining to this chapter, however, which is that Edelgard celebrates her 18th birthday on the 22nd of this month, meaning she's now eligible for combat. With that said, the fact that she was still level 1 by this point meant that she was more of a liability than anything. At the end of the chapter, I receive the Sword of the Creator, a relic weapon once wielded by the Liberation King, who brought untold horrors upon the people of Fodland. While it's debatable whether the relic weapons could be considered tools of warfare that cause widespread, indiscriminate harm, I err on the side of caution by stowing it in the convoy for the remainder of the game. Back at the monastery, I enlist the help of Mercedes for the next mission. Each month you can choose one student from outside your house to support you in the upcoming mission. I chose Mercedes in the hopes of building up a support rank to eventually recruit her to my house permanently. I also throw some gifts at her to speed things along. This month is also when we unlock the blacksmith. This will be a valuable vendor for upgrading and repairing weapons, but I do have to be careful with which upgrades I use. Poison weapons aren't uncommon in the Fire Emblem series, but Three Houses is unique in that it's one of the few games that allows the player to use them. You can upgrade iron weapons into venom weapons, but this is off limits for our law-abiding selves. It was also around this time that I updated my lesson plan. Edelgard was set to reason and faith in the hopes of guiding her towards a more peaceful future, whereas all of the ineligible students were set to focus on their strengths, with most students sitting at C to C plus rank. I also certified Ferdinand and Sylvain for the Brigand class, which would have an instrumental skill to offer in future. Chapter 5's mission sees us taking on Miklan, a disowned son from House Gautier turned bandit at Conan Tower. Fortunately, there's nothing too concerning about this mission. As Miklan is nothing more than a bandit now, international laws of conflict don't apply. Furthermore, Conan Tower is abandoned and not owned by any territory, meaning we're free to take from the chests inside. This chapter is also significant in that Edelgard isn't force deployed, so I assign her as an adjutant to help her gain some experience in the hopes that she can achieve some degree of combat relevance in the future. It was around this time that most of the combat was being handled by both Geneva and Sylvain. While Ferdinand and Dorothea were still leveled and participated when necessary, they began to take a bit more of a backseat. Despite their strength, however, this is a long, spiralling map, and it takes us 19 turns to finish. Rhea asks us to return the Lance of Ruin. While I have no intention of using it myself, I turn down her request as I'd rather keep the Lance in my own possession, in the hopes of preventing others from committing war crimes. At the monastery, I take advantage of the sauna to improve Geneva and Sylvain's training for the upcoming month. You can take two units into the sauna, and if you successfully reach the right level of heat, you'll gain a bonus on all training for the whole month. Geneva's free time is therefore spent on doing chores in the monastery and participating in faculty training. Axe and flying skills are still the priority, but I also put points into lances and bows when necessary, to qualify for certain requirements and to aid in recruiting the settings. Geneva received certification for the Brigand class this month as well. It's also worth noting that around this time, the Abyss quest through which you can recruit the Ashen Wolves becomes accessible. But for this challenge, I won't be recruiting them, nor any other DLC unlockable characters such as Anna. Chapter 6 is not my favourite map. Fortunately, there aren't any war crimes to contend with beyond the usual, as this is an abandoned tunnel within the monastery. I can loot the chests under the pretense of returning the contents to the faculty, that being me, but this chapter has a lot of diverging paths, which is a lot to deal with when my roster of capable units is so small. At least it would be if not for one new recruit, Shamir. Shamir is already a sniper, an advanced class which other units can only promote to at level 20. And that's not all, Shamir also has some pretty good experience gain, unlike most Fire Emblem pre-promotes. I also deploy Ferdinand and Dorothea to help out, as well as Hubert, but Edelgard isn't available for this map as she's busy doing things that I'm sure will be completely unrelated to the plot. I wanted to see if I could defeat the Death Knight, but even with Shamir added to the team, the Death Knight's damage output and ability to counter at range made this an impossible task. 
I was lacking any suitable combat arts, and the sword of the creator is off limits. So eventually I finish off the last regular enemy, which ends the chapter without having to fight the Death Knight. Up next is chapter 7, the Battle of the Eagle and Lion. But first, we've got some monastery chores to attend to, and they're pretty significant this time. First up is Sylvain's Paralog Mission, one of two Paralog missions I'll be completing in the challenge. Most Paralogs in Three Houses will bestow unique items, perhaps even a relic weapon, but Sylvain's is pretty straightforward for us. Stop the thieves from escaping with rare items, including stat boosters and accessories. After a few turns, the thieves will bolt to one of four escape points on the map, which can be disabled by defeating the boss in each corner. You've got to move quickly to catch all of the thieves, which makes this a great opportunity to introduce one of the most powerful gambits in Three Houses, which I'll be relying on a lot in this challenge, Stride. Stride grants units in an area around the target plus five movement, which considering most of my units only have four to five movement at the moment, is a huge bonus. This gambit is instrumental in catching the thieves in this parallel, but don't worry, we'll be seeing plenty more uses for this gambit very, very soon. The most notable drops here are the Energy Drop and the Speed Wing, which I distributed to my main carries, Geneva and Sylvain. This map was also where Sylvain mastered the Brigand class, granting the Deathblow skill. Deathblow gives an extra plus 6 strength on attacks made during player phase, which is great for enabling the proactive, hyper-offensive playstyle that I'll be relying on in this challenge. Back at the monastery, I reached another significant milestone. Mercedes was now willing to join our house. I'd been building support rank with Mercedes and training up her preferred skills since chapter 5, and at long last I could enjoy the fruits of my labor. The main reason I wanted Mercedes was to have a powerful healer at my disposal. Mercedes is one of two units with access to the Fortify spell, which heals every ally within a large area. The other unit is... Flane, who we did just recruit at the end of the last chapter. The problem is, Flane looks like a child. And while the game may list her age as question mark question mark, I don't think that defense would hold up at military tribunal. So Flane is benched. Sorry. Nevertheless, with Mercedes on board, I've got myself a powerful new magic user who'll be a very capable healer from the get-go, thanks to Physic. But little did I know, Mercedes would become invaluable to me in the not-so-distant future. Anyway, at last it's time for the Battle of the Eagle and Lion. Just like in Chapter 1, this is another mock battle, so unit deaths aren't penalized. I decided to take full advantage of this fact and use every unit at my disposal to lure in enemies and take hits, so that my training projects could get as much experience as possible. Both Geneva and Sylvain were nearing level 20, and I was eager to hit this goal as soon as possible. Geneva hit level 18 right at the start of battle, and mastered Brigand at the same time. And after painstakingly fighting off both the Blue Lions and Golden Deer at once, I reached the end of the map with just Geneva, Sylvain, and Edelgard left standing. Fortunately, Geneva hit level 20 while fighting the last of Claude's archers, though Sylvain finished just shy of level 20. At this point, we're a little over halfway through the Academy arc, and I'm feeling pretty good about the challenge. Geneva, Sylvain, and Shamir are turning into a formidable fighting force, and the only war crimes we've had to truly be wary of so far include child soldiers, pillaging, poison weapons, and a couple of non-combatants. I hadn't had to do any digging through the Rome Statute or Geneva Conventions in some time, and it's not unfair to say that I was growing a bit complacent. But little did I know how soon things would change, of the calamity that awaited me. At the monastery, there were two new additions to the team. After Chapter 7, I'm able to recruit both Hanuman and Manuela. I hadn't had much experience using either of these units before, but realistically I figured their main use will be to pad the roster a bit and provide a bit of extra magic support. The lesson plan was updated as well. Ferdinand was set to a riding focus around this time, on the off chance I would need riding drills in the war arc. Manuela and Hanuman were sent to faith and reason magic respectively, alongside riding, in the hopes that they would make it to masterclasses by the end of the challenge. Meanwhile, Shamir's focus, like Sylvain's, was on axes and flying. While Shamir was only sitting at a D plus in axes and a C in flying by this point, star pupil Sylvain was already at A rank for axes and a C plus for flying. I run another auxiliary battle to complete some quests and finally get Sylvain to level 20, allowing both him and Geneva to certify for the Wyvern Rider class. Wyvern Riders in three houses are juggernauts. Fantastic mobility, great strength and defense, and with all of the experience I have being funneled into so few units, both of them maintain enough of a level lead that they have enough speed to double any enemy they come across. Rest assured, you'll be seeing a lot of wyverns throughout this challenge. As a final bit of prep, I recruited the Seros Pegasus Knight Battalion to pair with my new wyvern riders. But at long last, it's time for the next mission. With new units, new power, and new confidence, I set out for Ramaya Village to tackle Chapter 8, aptly named the Ramaya Calamity. Kill! Kill! Help! Somebody please help! Oh no.
know. This chapter was a grim reminder of the challenge that I had set myself. This mission was the Colossal Titan, ready to shatter any semblance of confidence I had. Allow me to set the scene. Ramaya Village has been the target of some kind of attack, which has caused the villagers to turn violent. The majority of this map is littered with rampaging villagers, all of whom are classified as civilians. Yep, you can see where this is going. Article 8, Section 2E, Paragraph 1. Intentionally directing attacks against the civilian population or against individual civilians not taking direct part in hostilities is prohibited in armed conflicts not of an international character. Now, while it could be argued that these civilians are indeed taking direct part in hostilities, they're doing so against their will, and as a direct result of whatever experimentation those who slither in the dark have performed. So, for the sake of this challenge, we have to consider every villager on this map a protected individual. With that said, intentionally directing attack against a civilian adds another layer of challenge for one reason in particular. Just ahead of where Geneva and the team are deployed, there are three Knights of Seros and Geralt, sitting in a dense patch of forest. These allied NPCs will seek out any enemies in range and attack them, and if they're out of range, they'll start moving towards the closest enemy unit. Geralt at least has the decency to sit still, but if any villagers approach him, he'll put them in a grave quicker than you can say, Father, please stop, that's a war crime. The clear condition for this map is to defeat the boss. And I already know what some of you are about to say. You have stride, and you just got wyvern riders. Surely you can just fly over to the boss in one turn, defeat him, and clear the chapter without any hassle. If only it were that easy. The boss of this chapter is Solon, but until enemy phase on turn 3, he sits on the opposite side of the battlefield disguised as Tomas, an NPC who cannot be targeted. That means the absolute earliest I can end the chapter is on turn 3 enemy phase. But as he's fond of using his battalion gambit, which cannot be retaliated against, this essentially means turn 4 is the earliest this nightmare can end. Three turns of ensuring no villagers come under harm by my hand or the hands of the Knights of Seros. Three turns of ensuring that every single one of the 14 villagers is safeguarded from even a single point of damage inflicted. If that weren't enough, don't you worry. We're only getting started. It's at this point I learned that when you depart for a mission, the game prompts you to save. Once you save, there's no way to go back to the monastery menu to certify the new classes. Shamir had the skill proficiency necessary to certify for Pegasus Knight, with a pretty good success rate thanks to her high initial lance rank. But by this point, it was too late. I was stuck with whatever preparations I had already made. I could access vendors, the blacksmith, and the battalion guild, but after scouring through them in the search of anything that would help me in this hopeless situation, I came up empty-handed. At this point, it's worth establishing two more things. Firstly, it's impossible for all of the NPC villagers to end the map unharmed. Many of them are positioned in the far corners of the map in range of rampaging villages that will target them and attack them immediately. In addition, there are fire hazards dotted around the map, and if a villager ends their turn on these tiles, they'll take damage. Fortunately for me, however, neither of these occurrences qualify as myself or any affiliated parties committing a war crime. So if these occur, we're in the clear. And of course, while there are chests dotted around the village, we're not here to pillage. I miss out on a defense booster and a horse slayer as a result. So, I had no other choice but to start the mission. Geneva, Edelgard, Sylvain, Ferdinand, Shamir, Dorothea, Mercedes, Hanneman, Manuela, and Hubert, all ready for the fight of their lives. My first strategy was an inelegant but straightforward one. The biggest obstacle I faced was the Knights of Seros, particularly because there are two villages placed between them and my army right from the get-go. I knew that if I couldn't find a way to lure them outside of the range of the Knights of Seros, then the situation would be doomed from the get-go. I unequipped Ferdinand Chimir while giving everyone else in my army a training bow, the reason being that magic classes would default to retaliating with magic if they're attacked. Fortunately, the training bow is a weapon that every unit can wield regardless of class or rank. This meant that I could use units wielding training bows to lure villagers and soak up attacks without them harming the villagers. But just as it was important to deal with the villagers right in front of me, I also had to account for the villagers deeper into the map. There are a number of villagers close enough to the Knights of Seros to attack them within a single turn, but fortunately there are two well-placed choke points south of the forest which can be used to block several villagers from reaching them. I used Shamir and Sylvain to block these choke points, while Ferdinand went left to create as much distance between the pair of villagers there and the Knights as possible. Geneva moved up as far as possible to be ready for Solon when he appeared. Finally, Manuela, Hanneman, Dorothea, and Mercedes grouped up in the top right of the map to lure in the trio of villagers. Aggression lines were incredibly important here. You may have noticed them in some clips already, 
but when moving a unit within an enemy's range, the game will highlight the enemy's intended target. This is particularly important when moving multiple units within an enemy's range, as you can see exactly which unit an enemy will target. I ended the turn, and sure enough, the villagers all moved to their designated targets and remained unharmed in doing so. For a brief moment it seemed like maybe this impossible situation might just have a solution, but then my heart sunk. At the end of enemy phase, two more villagers appeared. One of them was behind one of the established choke points, but the other appeared only a few tiles away from where the Knights of Seros were located. One Knight of Seros was still close enough to attack a civilian, though he missed his attack. Somehow, I had made it past the first turn without any villagers coming under harm. But with that soldier's position, I knew it would be impossible to separate him from the villagers. So it was back to the drawing board. From that first attempt, I had learned two things. Firstly, I would need Geneva to help block the choke points. Even accounting for the bonus movement from Stride, there were only so many units capable of reaching the choke points through the forest on turn one. Shamir was necessary to lure out the villagers to the far left alongside Ferdinand, which meant Geneva was the only candidate left. Second, I could manipulate enemy aggression in a way that would be beneficial to me. Villagers were more motivated to attack Dorothea over Edelgard, for example, as Dorothea had less HP and defense than Edelgard, despite her level advantage. If I had Dorothea equip her magic, however, she would be able to retaliate, tricking the villagers' AI into targeting Edelgard instead. This allowed me to push forward with some units while keeping the villagers lured away from the Knights of Seros. This time, I was once again able to get through turn one unscathed and all of the Knights of Seros were still grouped up in the Central Forest, but the reinforcements still presented a problem. With the mages luring a group of villagers in the corner, there was no way to get additional villagers to their location. In addition, I couldn't block the new villager without moving someone away from the choke point on the right. The best solution I could see was to move Mercedes up into the forest with another stride from Hubert. Sylvain moved a bit to the right, so that the villager would attack Mercedes from a forest while Geneva took his place in the right choke point, and Dorothea took the place of Geneva in the left choke point. The end result was that every villager was accounted for except one, who would attack Mercedes from a forest right next to a Knight of Seros. Preventing his attack wouldn't be possible, but preventing any damage was. Forests give an avoid bonus to any unit within them, and when the villager was in the forest, the attacking soldier's hit chance went from about 80% to 50%. It's not quite enough to put my concerns to rest, but it's enough to give me hope. The enemy phase of turn 2 pans out much the same as it did for turn 1. The villagers attacked my unarmed units, and the villager moved onto the forest as expected. All I needed was for the Knight of Seros to miss. Please! Please! Yes! Oh, it's possible! As if by some minor miracle, I had made it to turn 3. The last turn I needed to survive before Solon would become vulnerable. Geneva moved up to be ready to strike him down, as well as deal with some of the enemy units in the area. As these enemies near to Amasa classified as soldiers rather than civilians, I can attack them freely to prepare for Solon's arrival. I moved Dorothea over to the right choke point to take Geneva's place, which left Shamir tackling the left. Everything else remained unchanged, as I didn't have anywhere safe I could lure the villagers I'd already dragged away. At last, Solon threw away his disguise, and in doing so he kills every NPC villager on the map. Those who slither in the dark have fewer reservations about war crimes than I do, it seems. But at last, my chance had presented itself. All I needed was to get through the enemy phase and ally phase unscathed. Ferdinand and Edelgard's defense kept them safe. Dorothea dodged incoming attacks in the forest, and the mages in the back line used every vulnerary at their disposal to stay alive. It all came down to whether the Knight of Seros harmed the villager. If you dodge, this is doable, please. Oh my god. There's a chance! Please! Please let it be over! My prayers had been answered. Solon was vulnerable, and every villager on the map remained unharmed. Except for one, who took damage from standing in fire, but fortunately the Geneva Conventions don't prohibit stupidity. There was one problem though. Geneva had been hit by Solon's gambit, and couldn't move. She could only attack at two range, and while she was equipped with a hand axe, it wasn't enough damage to kill Solon in one hit and Geneva only had 9 HP left. But as lacking as my preparation for this chapter had been, there was one thing which saved me from the brink of despair. Mercedes was just in range to cast Physic on Geneva, which gave her just enough HP to survive Solon's attack with one health remaining. Finishing him off and ending the chapter. The Ramaya Calamity was a tribulation like no other. A grim reminder that the path I had set out to walk was far from an easy one. 
And yet somehow, against all odds, I prevailed. None of the villagers had been harmed by my hand, but this victory came after countless attempts and many, many failures. I cannot believe that. Ugh. No, please. No, no. Forgive me. No. For the first time in this challenge, I was relieved to return to the monastery. And this was probably the last noteworthy month for monastery free time. Chapter 9 takes place during the 12th month of the Fodland calendar, the Ethereal Moon. There are a few events that take place this month, but the most important one for me is the White Heron Cup, a dance competition which bestows the unique dancer class on the winning student. Anyone who's played Fire Emblem before knows how valuable a dancer can be, as they can allow any unit within their movement range to act again. The problem was, I didn't have anyone particularly well suited to becoming a dancer, so I set out to recruit one final student. At first I looked to Marianne, as her high faith rank would allow her to play the support role effectively straight out of the box. But unfortunately, one of the skills Marianne seeks in The Professor is riding, which I've wholly neglected thus far. So instead, I sought out Ingrid. Fortunately, my training into flying meant that Ingrid was already willing to join my house. There was one caveat here, in that she's still only 17 years old, so we won't be able to deploy her until she's 18. But fortunately, this is the following month. For now, I choose her as our house representative for the White Heron Cup, and give her a dance lesson to boost her charm by five. With a new student comes a new lesson plan. Ingrid was immediately set to reason and faith skill focus, while everyone else continued their usual lessons. Mercedes hit B rank in reason and faith magic this month, while most other students were sitting at about a B plus in their preferred skills. Fast forwarding to the chapter 9 map, this battle sees us fighting a number of demonic beasts. Honestly, there's really not much to talk about with this map. There aren't any major considerations on the war crime front, and now that I have Geneva and Sylvain leading the charge as Wyvern Riders, most maps can be dealt with pretty quickly. We finish the chapter in four turns, and receive an energy drop as a reward for protecting all of the students. Geneva goes through the Fire Emblem protagonist's rite of passage, and we're right back into monastery chores. Only one thing to note this time, I decided to complete the paralogue mission Tales of the Red Canyon. This paralogue doesn't have any item or weapon rewards which are relevant to the challenge, but it does grant an extra three uses of Divine Pulse upon completion, which I was keen to have access to after the headaches of the Ramaya Calamity. This map plays out much like the story battle before, with lots of monster enemies to deal with. While monster enemies can be threatening thanks to their widespread attacks, my strategy for dealing with them boils down to breaking their armor in one spot, and focusing my attacks there to deal damage twice as quickly as I otherwise would. This makes it much easier to chip through several health bars and take them out. The chest from chapter 2 is also here once again with a new item inside, but we leave it unclaimed for the same reasons back then. Up next is chapter 10, with two objectives. First is to defeat Kronya in the center of the map, and second is to then defeat Solon, who appears just up the hill further north. While there's also a handful of enemies to deal with before we can reach them, that's not much of a problem for Stride plus Wyvern Riders. Kronya can be a little tricky to pin down. She threatens critical hits on most of my units, and Geneva isn't fast enough to double. I use a gambit to weaken her and keep her immobilized before finishing her off on the following turn. After the cutscene, all of my unit's actions are refreshed, and everyone has moved to the forest south of Solon. More enemies spawn in, but fortunately they don't pose much of a threat. My mages take out the armored knight blocking the way, and then Geneva can run back chapter 8 and take out Solon in a single round of combat. The next chapter, chapter 11, is an important one. Perhaps one of the most important in the whole run. But put simply, there wasn't really anything left for me to do at the monastery that I haven't already covered. Most free time for the rest of the academy arc at this point was spent training up Geneva's skills for future class certification, continuing the same lesson plans as before, and so on. The only thing of note was that I was able to recruit Alois, whom I expected would mainly be used as a rally bot and occasional meat shield. Chapter 11 takes place at the Holy Tomb. We visit this site with the Archbishop Rhea, only to be cut off by Edelgard, who has infiltrated the monastery with soldiers from the Imperial Army. And with this, it's time to address what we all knew deep down. Just like Dimitri, and just like Claude, in fact arguably more so than either of them, Edelgard commits war crimes. In fact, she's unique in the sense that while Dimitri and Claude's war crimes occur in the war arc, Edelgard commits war crimes in the academy arc. So let's start to go through these one by one, because rest assured, there are a few of them. First is Article 8, Section 2B, Paragraph 7, making improper use of uniforms. Bringing Imperial troops into the monastery under disguise to be used in combat is prohibited. But that's not all. 
Edelgard also has a number of demonic beasts at her disposal, who we now know are humans who have undergone some kind of transformation or experimentation. This breaches Section 1, Article 147 in the 4th Geneva Convention, which outlaws torture or inhumane treatment. Plus, you can also add Section 2b, Paragraph 10 from the Rome Statute, if those individuals were not from the Adrestian Empire. The demonic beasts themselves could also be considered methods of warfare which are of a nature to cause superfluous injury, or are inherently indiscriminate considering the cutscene with Miklan from Chapter 5, which demonstrates that the demonic beasts act with a mind of their own in senseless rampage. This would add Section 2b, Paragraph 20. In addition, Edelgard's seizure of the crest stones from the Holy Tomb is a breach of Section 2b, Paragraph 13, for seizing the enemy's goods and or property unless such destruction or seizure be imperatively demanded by the necessities of war. You could also consider Section 2b, Paragraph 9, as intentionally directing attacks against buildings dedicated to religion is prohibited, provided they're not military objectives. But there's a more defensible argument that Garrick Mark is a significant military objective. So depending on how you interpret many of her actions, Edelgard commits three war crimes at minimum with this attack on a good day, and twice as many on a bad day. But first, we have to deal with the battle at hand. The objective is to defeat Edelgard, but we face a new problem which will become much more frequent after the Academy arc. Section 2b, paragraph 15 of the statute prohibits compelling the nationals of the hostile party to take part in the operations of war directed against their own country, even if they were in the belligerent service before the commencement of war. This means that in any conflict against the Adrestian Empire, any units affiliated with the Empire are off-limits, namely Dorothea and Ferdinand. The same could be argued for Manuela and Hanuman, but as their affiliation at the start of the game is to the Church of Seros, they are disregarded. This doesn't just apply to units, however. Many of the battalions that you can hire in Three Houses will represent a certain group or nation. As I've been on the Black Eagles route, many of my battalions are Empire soldiers, who I can no longer use in combat against the Empire. So, I dismiss any and all battalions consisting of Imperial soldiers. Fortunately, we now have several faculty members, as well as students recruited from other houses to patch this up. Much like the chapters before, Geneva and Sylvain take the lead and rush to Edelgard's position, while clearing out any major threats in the meantime. We also have the addition of Ingrid now, who's finally celebrated her 18th birthday, which helps speed this process along considerably. And with Edelgard and her generals positioned on a balcony at the bottom of the map, I have free reign to employ hit and run tactics to chip away at her soldiers. I take her out with ease, while managing to protect all of the crest stones in doing so. And so, at the end of this battle comes one of the more important decisions in this challenge. The choice of whether to side with Edelgard and embark on the Crimson Flower route, or to side with Rhea and the Church and embark on the Silver Snow route. Unfortunately for Edelgard, Siding with her at this point would be to accept responsibility for the countless war crimes she's already committed. This makes affiliating with Edelgard in the Adrestian Empire impossible. So we choose to side with the Church instead, who as of yet have not committed a war crime. Let's see if we can keep it that way. Back at the monastery, we now have lots to do. Edelgard and Hubert are no longer in our roster, but instead we have three new units, Seteth, Catherine, and Cyril. Seteth and Catherine are the standouts here. Seteth is another Wyvern Rider who will quickly become one of our most reliable units, whereas Catherine is a strong Swordmaster who's much more combat effective than someone like Alois or Hanneman. Cyril, on the other hand, is a child soldier, but he'll be relevant eventually. For now, I stick her skill focus to axes and flying, and pass the time with seminars because the monastery chores are starting to wear my patience. Before too long, the Imperial Army is upon us once again. And though our students declare their resolve to stop Edelgard and fight the Imperial Army, I know better than to risk a war crime. They're all benched. But fortunately, we don't need to rely on them anymore. Shamir finally reached level 20 to become a Wyvern Rider, making four in total with Seteth. Geneva barrels down the center path towards Edelgard while my other units take care of the Death Knight. I don't have any need for the Dark Seal that he drops, but I was keen to enact some revenge after all the grief he'd given me previously. Hubert is also present on this map to the far left side, but I don't really have a reason to go fight him. The map ends after Edelgard is defeated after all, so once she was close enough for my units to group up and engage, I took Edelgard out alongside her generals. I end the map in just five turns. And with that, we've made it to the War Arc. If the Academy Arc was there to whet our appetite for the possible war crimes we might commit, it was time for the main course. And five years later, it seems that Fodlin isn't doing too well. The Kingdom and Alliance are in disarray, Edelgard is nearing complete conquest despite her treacherous war crimes, it falls to me to stop her. But before we can even fight the Imperial Army once more, we have to deal with Chapter 13, Hunting by Daybreak. This chapter is notorious for being a power check of sorts. 
In Silver Snow, we start the chapter with Geneva and Seteth, but on later turns, the Black Eagle students will return to the monastery and join the battle. Fortunately, our opponents here are mere bandits, so I don't need to worry about compelling them into conflict against the Empire. But the problem is, most of these units are nothing more than a liability. Kaspar, Petra, Linhart, and Bernadetta have barely developed beyond their base stats, while even Dorothea and Ferdinand are a good six or seven levels behind the generic enemies by now. This means that all of the combat falls to Geneva and Seteth. But there's another problem. This map, only on hard and maddening difficulties, has a huge number of archers, one of the few classes capable of dealing heavy damage to my wyvern riders, often enough to two-hit KO them. And Geneva wasn't strong enough to kill them in a single hit with a hand axe. Couple that with a number of thieves and assassins who are fast enough to avoid follow-up attacks, and the urgency necessary to stop my underleveled students from ending up skewered on the end of a weapon, and it's fair to say that this map presented more of a challenge than I was expecting. I found a solution quite quickly. Most of the enemies on this map are stationary, until a foe enters their range. In addition, Wyvern Riders have the ability to dismount in this game. Doing so grants a minor stat penalty, but it allows the unit to benefit from terrain bonuses and removes their weakness to bows. With this strategy, I was able to advance into forests, dismount, and deal with the surrounding enemies, before mounting up once more and moving into the next group of enemies. It was a slow process, especially because Geneva was the only one really capable of taking on several enemies at once. But Seteth was able to provide valuable support by luring enemies away from the students, while even Dorothea found some use with her long-range magic and healing. This is a good time to mention our new affiliation as well. From the beginning of the war arc, all of our existing units are now members of the Resistance Army, rather than the Church of Seraphs. This includes all of the Adrestian students from the Black Eagle House, but as they were Adrestian nationals in the Academy arc, they'll still be prohibited from fighting against their homeland. Not only was this map extremely beneficial for gaining experience, with both Byleth and Seteth gaining three whole levels each, it also has a huge number of droppable items. I was able to gain several concoctions, many silver weapons, gold, and some accessories. The four chests on this map were also mine for the taking, as we're returning to the monastery as its leader. Most of note here was the Axe of Ukon Vasra, a powerful A-rank axe that deals bonus damage to armored foes and heals the user on player phase, which would come in handy very soon. After a grueling 22 turns of combat, I cleared the chapter, reunited with my other units, and returned to the monastery with full access once again. The first thing I did was try to promote Geneva to Wyvern Lord, but I was unlucky with a 72% chance failure. Nevertheless, I also certified Dorothea to the Warlock class, on the off chance that I'd find use for. Most of the monastery time was spent honing Geneva's skills to ensure that I could promote to Wyvern Lord before the next battle, but I also indulged in the monthly tournament for a new weapon reward and established some new lesson plans. Cyril was now old enough to legally deploy, and Sylvain had all of the skill ranks necessary for Wyvern Lord, so I set Shamir and Cyril to group tasks to train their flying skills. I hurried through the month with seminars and then finally certified Geneva for Wyvern Lord her final class for the rest of the challenge, as well as the bishop certification for Mercedes. This brings us to chapter 14. This is the same map as chapter 12, but with a few new differences. There are a few additional barricades, as well as breakable walls, but we can't destroy these without breaching section 2b paragraph 5, which forbids attacking towns, villages, or buildings which are undefended and are not military objectives. Starting the chapter, Seteth did make an alarming comment, but my memory of this map was rusty, and I couldn't see any sign that he was actually acting on what he said, so I pushed it from my mind for now. Geneva is force deployed on the far right this time, so I used Sylvain and my other Wyvern Riders to break the enemy's central vanguard, prioritizing archers and cavalry to ensure that everyone remained safe. At the end of turn one, an allied sword master appears on the right hand side, who marches towards a siege weapon to the south. Having cleared the path of enemies with Geneva, I escorted them with Catherine and set my sights on the central skirmish. My flyers were able to take care of the majority of the enemy forces. With the levels he earned in the previous chapter, Seteth was quickly becoming on par with Sylvain. Shamir lacked speed compared to her rivals, but she made up for it with powerful bow attacks, allowing her to pick off foes from afar and retreat using Kanto. With Geneva ready to group up with the central force, the map was all but solved. At least that's what I thought. Remember when Seteth was talking about using fire? I, of course, assumed he was joking, as that would be in breach of paragraphs 2, 5, and 20 of section 2b in the Rome Statute. Unfortunately, he was not. If you escort the Swordmaster to the highlighted tile on the right-hand side of the battlefield, Seteth will go to the enemy commander into stepping forward, at which point he raises the entire town with a fire attack. Naturally, I had to intervene, so I placed Catherine on the highlighted tile, preventing the allied soldier from enacting their heinous plan. I then spent the remaining turns routing the rest of the enemy force, clearing the chapter in 9 turns. 
This month's monastery chores were reasonably uneventful, with the most noteworthy acquisition being Mercedes finally learning the fortify spell at last. With that, it's time for chapter 50. A skirmish with soldiers from the old Fargus territories, led by General Gwendol of House Rome. Though I couldn't find any evidence that any of the soldiers from Fargus had any relation or affiliation to House Rowe, I erred on the side of caution and undeployed anyone that might qualify, namely Sylvain, Ingrid, and Mercedes. I also deployed Cyril as an adjutant to Geneva to help him gain experience without actually having to see combat. This map also marks our first encounter with an old student. Ash from the Blue Lion House is deployed here as a sniper. Unfortunately for him, nothing in the Rome statute exists to prevent us from chopping him down with our white friend. And although there aren't any major war crimes beyond the aforementioned that I need to be aware of here, it's worth noting that the enemy soldiers not only disguise as Alliance soldiers for the sake of this ambush, but they also employ poison weapons. So chalk up two more points for war crimes committed by the opposition. Speaking of the Alliance, the hero of Daphnel, Judith, appears in the northeast corner of the map after a turn or two, and Gwendol immediately charges her down. Though we have just enough time to loot the nearby chests for a new weapon and shield, as well as get some much needed experience on Seteth, Hanneman and Manuela, with Judith's situation looking more and more dire, I eventually swoop in to talk to her for an energy drop, and then take down Gwendol the following turn with Geneva. At the monastery once again, we promote Seteth to Wyvern Lord, and Hanneman to Warlock. Sylvain hits S rank in axes, and I start training Catherine in reason magic, in the hopes of promoting her to a mortal savant in the future. I also run a quick auxiliary battle, to get Shamir, Sylvain, and Cyril to level 30, unlocking their own Wyvern Lord promotions as well. Chapter 16 takes us to the Great Bridge of Murden, where we face off against both Imperial and Alliance forces. I take care of the initial group of enemies with my Wyvern Riders, and rush towards the fortress in the centre of the map to shut down the enemy's siege weapons. This plan seemed a sound one, until an Alliance leader teleported behind me for an ambush. Fortunately for someone talking a lot of smack, he was still in Wyvern Rider range, so I was able to take care of his entire ambush in one turn. With Acheron down, I set my sights on the Imperial Commander, but the Alliance wasn't done with me yet. Lawrence appeared with reinforcements, and as the clear condition for this chapter is to defeat all enemy commanders, the only way I can clear the chapter is by putting him six feet under. I used the choke points on the wooden bridge to deal with Lawrence and his allied general, while taking care of Ladislava, who made the bold choice to charge down Geneva with a gambit. I prolonged Lawrence's life for as long as I could to nab some extra experience, before laying him to rest in a manner truly fitting for nobility. Though, in my defense, the enemies on this chapter once again deploy poison weapons, so they're hardly saints. At the monastery, we hear news that the Battle of Gronda has left every participant devastated. The Empire has fallen back to lick their wounds, while Dimitri is counted among the dead and Claude is missing. More importantly, Alois starts to make some alarming comments ahead of the next battle. Using disguises? And something about it being my plan? Rest assured, there was nothing in the story to suggest such a plan had been discussed, let alone that it was Geneva's idea, so I dismissed his jest as nothing more than a bad joke. But if only it were that easy. Our next target is Fort Mercius, which you might recall was the reason why Claude's route was impossible to complete without committing a war crime. But I'm taken aback when Ferdinand informs me that the soldiers have finished changing into Imperial uniform to infiltrate the fort. Naturally, I question the use of disguises, and Seteth has the audacity to suggest that once again this was somehow my idea, when there had been no mention of using disguises prior to this cutscene, beyond a chat with Alois that could have easily been missed. I stare down the abyss with a sinking feeling in my heart. Is there nothing I can do to avoid such a devious act? Is there no way to defend myself against the black-hearted plot of my allies? It was at this time that I did some research into military laws around perfidy. Article 39 of the Geneva Convention states it plainly. Paragraph 2 says that it's prohibited to make use of the uniforms of adverse parties while engaging in attacks or to shield, favor, protect, or impede military operations. But against all odds, it was here that I found my solution. I'll draw your attention to Article 37, which outlines the prohibition of perfidy. Feigning an intent to negotiate, feigning incapacitation or sickness, feigning non-combatant status, and feigning protected status are all prohibited when used to kill, injure, or capture an adversary. But notably, ruses of war, as they're called, are not prohibited. Most notably, I found an example of a German World War II commander, Otto Skorzeny who led his troops wearing American uniforms to infiltrate the American front lines during the Battle of the Bulge. He was later acquitted by a United States military court because his soldiers took off the American uniforms and put on German uniforms before firing their weapons. This was the answer I had been looking for. In the preparation screen, all of my units were wearing their typical uniform dictated by their class that they'd worn in every chapter prior, so there could be no mistaking them for Imperial soldiers. To be extra safe, 
I dismissed every battalion from active deployment. This way I could be certain that the only combatants were those I could be certain were in standard uniform. Thankfully, these preparations were the most complicated part of the whole chapter. The Death Knight sits perched in the center of the map, with reinforcements spawning from the edges of the map every couple of turns. You could move a unit onto these tiles to cut off the reinforcements, but this honestly wasn't very necessary. The most amount of strategy required here was ensuring that Alois or Hanuman didn't get killed in a single round of combat, from the cavalry that now doubled them with ease thanks to the level cap that had started to grow. There are a couple of demonic beasts here as well, but nothing my vanguard of wyvern lords couldn't handle. Eventually, the Death Knight has a change of heart, and picks a corner of the map to flee to, but a lucky 8% crit from Geneva puts a stop to that very quickly. Those who slither in the dark then commit the most indiscriminate missile attack that Fodlan has ever seen, so don't forget to cross Orbital Missile Attack off of your Warcrime bingo card. No harm done though, so we head back to the monastery just in time for tea time with Sylvain and training grills. Chapter 18 takes us to the Imperial capital of Enbar at last. This is a pretty large map, and our team deploys in two locations. The first team, led by Geneva, deploys at the top of the map near the Death Knight, while the second team, led by Sylvain and Seteth, deploys in the city's eastern back streets, with a route towards Hubert. Pretty much every enemy type is accounted for here as well. Warlocks, Fortress Knights, Paladins, Swordmasters, Demonic Beasts, and even some soldiers from those who sliver in the dark among the Adrestians. We also have some new tools to play around with as well, however. Many enemies on this map drop Brave Weapons, which are powerful player phase weapons that can allow up to four attacks if you outspeed the opponent. They're also available in the marketplace, so I buy up as many as I can and give them to my strongest units, Geneva, Sylvain, and Seteth. My first priority is securing a safe area for the more vulnerable units in my army to move safely. I use Shamir and Geneva to pick off isolated enemies using the outer walls to stay out of reach when necessary. Meanwhile, Seteth and Sylvain clear the enemy encampment over the river, disabling the siege weapons there. Enemy reinforcements on turn 4 posed a problem, however. Three Falcon Knights and a Demonic Beast from the north, right next to my vulnerable units. I keep Geneva back and wait for the reinforcements to arrive, using Geneva, Shamir, and Dance from Ingrid to take out the major threats. Once they'd all been dealt with, I lured the Death Knight in with Geneva and defeated him for the final time with a combat art. Meanwhile, Sylvain and Seteth pushed up and started to pick off enemies near Hubert. While the Adrestian Dark Mage has a bolting spell which can do significant damage, I was able to take advantage of this. Baiting him into equipping the spell makes him incredibly vulnerable to attack due to its high weight. I kept my units outside of his range while dealing with the horde of enemies that still remained. Once the threats had been dealt with, Geneva descended on Hubert with a stride boost and dance from Ingrid, felling him in a single combat. After the battle, Dudu arrives to confirm things we already know and share his mission to fight Edelgard single-handedly. Rather than tell him the plethora of reasons he'd be safer tagging along with us, we let him waltz away. It's straight into chapter 19 for us though, no monastery time allowed. Chapter 19 can be a challenging one, primarily due to the starting position. The Imperial Palace is a sprawling area with several rooms all filled with powerful enemies. For the first time in the challenge, I deploy Cyril as a unit rather than an adjutant to Geneva as well. He managed to reach level 36, just by accompanying Geneva during the war arc. And while his strength is a little lacking, the rest of his stats are good enough that he'll be a useful addition, especially with the enemy density on this map, as well as a number of demonic beasts. Just like the previous chapter, my first priority is secure the central area so that my vulnerable units can operate safely. I take out the enemies in the starting room with my wyverns and lure in one of the two giant demonic beasts with Catherine. From here, there are two approaches we can take. The first is to travel through the side rooms towards the throne room, whereas the second is to open the door directly there and fight the enemies within head-on. I decide on the latter, but not before moving Geneva into the side room to take out a ballista, which would otherwise threaten my flanks. I work on taking out as many enemies as possible before opening the door with Shamir and Mercedes, but a group of mages in the southern room start to push forward. Dudu arrives in the throne room ready to smack some fools and take zero damage in the process. But with a group of mages right beside the throne, I know I have to move quickly if I want Dudu to survive. I leave Seteth and Catherine back to deal with the mages, while the rest of my army pushes forward into the throne room. The mages do start to threaten Dudu, but he survives the attack and kills one in response. I quickly dispatch the other two, and use my brave weapons and combat arts to take out the demonic beast. I top up Dudu's health while I have a chance as well. There may not be a reward for keeping him alive, but after everything I've endured up to this point, I didn't see much point in letting him die needlessly. With the remaining stragglers in the throne room defeated, all that remained was fighting Edelgard herself. Facing Edelgard can be worrisome with her crit rates, but after landing a blow with Sylvain to soften her up, Geneva lands a lucky critical hit to render my efforts meaningless, ending the chapter in 8 turns. The cutscene that follows is a tricky one. One could argue that Edelgard's insistence for Geneva to finish her off is akin to surrender, 
as she knows that fighting on would be impossible. This would make harming Edelgard in such a scenario a war crime, but we're in luck. Hubert has left us a letter, to be delivered in the event of the Empire's defeat, which states that as Edelgard would never surrender, she has no doubt been slain in combat. Beyond simply absolving us of a possible war crime, Hubert's letter urges us to defeat those who slither in the dark in their stead. Seteth agrees, though will ignore exactly how he suggests we do it, because declaring no quarter is a war crime. Haven't you learned anything, Seteth? Back at the monastery, Mercedes promotes to Gremory, Cyril promotes to Wyvernlord, and Catherine promotes to Mortal Savant, though it took more than a few attempts for Catherine to pass her certification exam. And that's it, really. At this point in the game, there's really nothing the monastery has left to offer that's necessary to reach the endgame. So that leaves us with chapter 20, the penultimate chapter, and the final battle against those who slither in the dark. This chapter has cause for celebration. With Edelgard's defeat in the previous chapter, we've defeated the last opponents we'll face from the Adrestian Empire. This means that our Adrestian students are able to be deployed again, but more importantly than that, I can now hire the Empire Battalions to use with my flyers. The observant among you may have noticed that only Geneva and Seteth have had battalions for the majority of the war. The reason being that there were only two battalions of flying units that were available who weren't affiliated with the Empire. With this problem now behind me, I hire the best battalions at my disposal and equip them to my flyers. The map itself is pretty straightforward. Though my army is split into four small groups dotted around each corner of the map, all that's required is reaching the central chamber, unlocking the door, and giving Thallus a hearty bash on the head. Regardless, I took the opportunity to get as much experience as possible for my flyers. I had Sylvain and Geneva converge in the southwestern corner alongside Shamir, Alois, and Manuela, while Seteth, Mercedes, and Ingrid cut through a Titanus in the northeast to join up with them. There are a few chests here available as well, but we'll consider Shambhala a protected environment and refrain from looting. Beyond that, there aren't any war crimes for us to fear. I clear out the central courtyard of enemies with a stride and bring all of my units into position to storm the central chamber. Shamir unlocks the door, revealing Thalas inside with a group of guards. While Thalas wields some of the most threatening dark magic in the game, he's remarkably similar to Solon, in the sense that fighting him is as easy as waltzing forward with Geneva and smacking him into the grave, clearing the chapter in seven turns. With the defeat of those who slither in the dark, we have one final chapter ahead of us, and then the challenge is complete. We return to the monastery, but frankly, I just skipped the entire month. This brings us to the final battle, a skirmish with the Immaculate One and her soldiers, the Children of the Goddess, and members of the Church of Saros. The moment I saw this map, my heart sank. The Ramaya Calamity had been an impossible challenge, but now it seemed as though I might face the same again, this time with the most powerful enemies in the entire challenge. Defeating the Immaculate One without harming a single other enemy seemed an insurmountable challenge, especially considering that she fully heals if a single white beast is within 10 tiles. Or so I thought. Most of the war crimes we've discussed have been from one of two sections, section 2B and 2E. Section B concerns conflicts of an international nature, whereas section E concerns other serious violations in armed conflicts not of an international character. But we also have section 2F, which reads as follows. Paragraph 2E applies to armed conflicts not of an international character, and thus does not apply to situations of internal disturbances and tensions, such as riots, isolated and sporadic acts of violence, or other acts of a similar nature. In other words, because this conflict was between the Resistance Army, affiliated with the Church, and the Church itself, none of the prohibited war crimes apply to this conflict. We were in the home stretch all along. I just hadn't realized it. All that remained was to defeat the Immaculate One and claim victory. But even without prohibited actions, this was easier said than done. My army consisted of four strong combat units in Geneva, Sylvain, Seteth, and Shamir. A few backup fighters in Cyril and Catherine, the supporting cast of Mercedes, Ingrid, Dorothea, and Manuela, and lastly, Alois and Hanuman, who remained for chip damage and rally skills. Opposing me was the Immaculate One herself, four golems, seven white beasts, and about 30 fully promoted enemies. I dug in and prepared for a long battle. We deploy in the center of the map, with foes surrounding our position. The first challenge was breaking through the enemies to the south. There was one white beast block in the path, but if a single unit could reach the southern stronghold, I could cut off additional reinforcements. I entrusted this task to Seteth, while Geneva and Sylvain tackled the group of enemies to the west. I planned to clear out this area as a safe space for the rest of my army to move around and operate. But this was easier said than done. The path from the center of the map to the west was covered with buildings and forests to impede movement, and a group of soldiers, including cavalry and falcon knights from the east, were quickly closing in, 
Using every tool at my disposal, I took down a white beast to the west. Or so I thought. One mechanic of monsters which I haven't had much reason to discuss are latent abilities. These are abilities that remain inactive until the monster has lost HP crystals. But the white beasts are unique in that one of their latent abilities is Miracle, a skill which has a percentage chance of allowing the creature to survive a lethal blow. In the case of the white beasts, this was 30%. I moved Geneva in as the last possible combatant to finish off a white beast when this happened. <gasps> There's no way. Wait, Ferdinand! Oh my god, that is the oh, first Adjutant follow up attack I've seen in the entire run! And it's so crucial! Oh my god, Ferdinand, you're a hero. Though I'd had a stroke of good fortune, I wasn't out of the woods yet. I still faced enemies from every angle. I defeated the most mobile remaining enemies as a matter of urgency, stopping a Great Knight and a pair of Falcon Knights approaching from the north. I then set my sights on finishing off the group that had pressed in from the east. Sylvain took out the Gremory, while Seteth handled the Holy Knight. Turn by turn, the horde of enemies gradually began to thin, and I was able to keep everyone healthy thanks to Mercedes's Fortify spell. I take out another White Beast with my Wyverns, and have Geneva fell a sniper, leaving the remaining enemy force on the opposite side of the walls. Once again, I'm left with a choice. Do I charge down the central drawbridge, or work my way around the side? Though this time, I decide on the latter. Staying too close to the Immaculate One leaves me vulnerable to Hoarfrost, a devastating AoE attack that can deal a crushing blow if I group my army too close together. I start moving my army to the western path at long last, while assailing the monsters and golems over the walls with my flyers. I'm able to lure another white beast over the wall and take it out with a combined assault, leaving just three more left standing and only one in my direct route. A golem moves forward to guard the western entrance, but I take it out with a combined attack and breach the inner walls. Though I'd initially feared the white beasts, Shamir and Cyril proved effective damage dealers thanks to their proficiency with bows, despite being weaker than Geneva, Seteth, and Sylvain against other enemy types. Another combined assault takes out the white beast, and after clearing out a few nearby foot soldiers, I'm left with a clear route to the Immaculate One. This is the final boss we're talking about here, and taking her down is no easy feat. The Immaculate One occupies a 3x3 space, and has shielded areas on each tile that must be destroyed before she'll take any reasonable amount of damage. I chipped at the Immaculate One's shields with Sylvain and Shamir, keeping them nearby to strengthen Geneva's gambit. This exposed two weak points, which offered an opportunity to take out the first of four HP crystals, unlocking the Miracle skill in doing so. Another gambit the following turn alongside an attack from Sylvain created another opening. I used Seteth's Brave Lance to put the Immaculate One as a sliver of health, just enough for Shamir to land an arrow and take out a second HP crystal. Just two more to go. I used Cyril to land some chip damage, and Ingrid dances for Geneva, granting another action and allowing her to take out another HP crystal with the Brave Axe. I keep Geneva away from the rest of my army to avoid heavy damage from Hoarfrost, and use Mercedes to heal the wounded. Beginning what I hope will be the final turn of the challenge, I use Cyril and Shamir to break the Immaculate One's armor and position them nearby for linked attacks. Seteth deals a flurry of blows with the Brave Lance, chipping the Immaculate One down to just 89 health, putting the Immaculate One in perfect range for Geneva to deal the final blow, even accounting for the chance of a Miracle Proc. And with that decisive blow, we finish the final map in 14 turns, bringing the challenge to a close. And with that, we conclude Geneva Percent, the challenge run to see if it's possible to complete Fire Emblem Three Houses without committing a war crime. Is it possible? Yes, debatably. There are a few grey areas, such as the skirmish with Lord Lazo's militia, directing attacks at versus harming civilians at Ramaya Village, using enemy uniforms to infiltrate Fort Mercius, and so on. But at the very least, we can say that completing the game with a position that might just hold up at Military Tribunal is indeed possible. It's worth noting at this point as well that while I've not played the Verdant Wind route, I suspect it may too be possible to clear this challenge there, for the same reason that Fort Mercius is possible in Silver Snow, but I'll leave confirmation of that to someone else. For now, I'm content with having succeeded in this challenge, despite the obstacles faced along the way. And though my opinion of Three Houses before this challenge wasn't the highest, Replaying the game in this challenge made me realize the strengths of the game's world building, music, and characters. While I still recognize the problems that the game has with pacing and map diversity, it's a game that I can now look back at a little more fondly. And most importantly, we now have definitive proof that yes, Edelgard did do something wrong. Many, many, many things. Thank you for joining me for the ride. I hope you enjoyed watching the video as much as I enjoyed making it. If you like this content, don't forget to like and subscribe, and let me know what you'd like to see me tackle next. 